All right, great. Hello, everyone. My name is Jim Seberg. I'm the Assistant Director for the Medical Cannabis Research Center. Today, we are proud to present uh, Dr. Mike Butler um, to present on the uh, pharmacology of cannabis on a 101 level. Um, Mike Butler has worked um, with the Healing Research Center in establishing six dispensaries across the state of uh, Pennsylvania. Um, they've recently been brought out by Verano, who will be continuing to help us out on our scientific advisory board, um, as well as doing research uh, uh, along with the team. Uh, Mike, if you want to start sharing your screen, and I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jim, for the introduction. So, so everybody knows. Um, yes, I've been involved with the business for a while and also a professor of pharmacology at a local university here. So, guys, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. We're going to start the presentation. All right. Um, let me see. There we go. We're going to minimize that. All right, so what we're talking about today is the endocannabinoid system and some cannabis pharmacology. Um, endocannabinoid system is, you know, what we have in our bodies that responds to these molecules and a little bit about the pharmacology. Uh, we're going to kind of try to keep this, like Jim said, at the one-on-one -on -one level. What I really want today, um, what I really am looking for as an objective is for everybody that leaves here today to have a good understanding um, of just how this molecule acts in your body and how it produces some of the primary effects that we know of, like pain control, uh, like controlling seizures um, and, and things like that. So hopefully we can get it pretty basic for you. Um, so launching in here. And there we go. All right, so just a little brief history. I know every time if you have ever seen a presentation on medical marijuana or anything like that, there's always this you know, big presentation about um, the history of cannabis. I'm gonna skip all that. We're gonna go straight to 1964 uh, when tetrahydrocannabinol or THC, which is the primary active ingredient in marijuana was first isolated by the Israeli chemist, uh, Raphael Machulam. And that's at the Weissman Institute of Science in Rehovot, Israel. So 1964 is when we first isolated and identified this particular molecule. Um, the first receptor, which any molecule that's a cell signaling molecule is not good by itself, it's gotta have a receptor. The CB1 was identified in 1988. And then Lisa Masuda picked that up pretty quick from the National Institute of Mental Health and announced the identification of the DNA sequencing that defines this THC sensitive receptor. Shortly after 1992, the first true endocannabinoid, um, CB1 agonist. So this is an endocannabinoid or in, an endogenous cannabinoid is something that our body makes uh, that's very similar in structure to THC or CBD. And it's what our body uses to bind at these receptors as a ligand and cause that downstream effect. And we call that n arachidonyl ethanolamide, uh, but we shorten that down to anandamide. And that was isolated also by Raphael Maculum and all colleagues at the National Institute of Mental Health. So he did a lot of work over in our country as well. Shortly after that, in 1995, um, Raphael Maculum and colleagues discovered the endocannabinoid 2-AG or 2-arachidonic glycerol that attaches to both um, CB1 and CB2 receptors. So what we need is in the, in the cannabinoid system, Basically, this is a homeostatic system, which means it regulates uh, how our body functions, um, regulating a lot of different things, modulation of pain, appetite, digestion, mood, seizure threshold, coordination, and many other processes. And it also influences immunomodulation uh, or downregulation of the immune system. Uh, it does have some cardiovascular effects. Uh, there are sensory integration. It has a role in tumor surveillance. Uh, does have some effects at the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Uh, affects neuronal development. And as we all know, interocular pressure, which is related to glaucoma. Now, this system is composed of endocannabinoids, which are the chemical messengers. Receptors, which are basically little antennas on the outside of the cell that receive this message. And regulatory enzymes that both create or catabolize um, these endocannabinoids and also metabolize or degrade them and break them down. 
Uh, we have an extensive network of endocannabinoid receptors that's been identified throughout the body with the highest concentrations in the CNS or the central nervous system, which is comprised of the brain and uh, the brain, brain and brain stem and spinal cord, and also in the immune system. So there's just a few components that we need to identify a system and think of a system as this is a cell signaling system. And when you think of cells, primarily think of really, really long skinny cells called neurons, nerve cells. So some cells are globular and fat. Some cells are long and skinny like your fingers. Some cells are super, super long, almost like a piece of thread that's frayed out at the ends. And your nerve cells in your body are those pieces of thread. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. So we've gotta have cell surface receptors. Cells respond to signals. They respond to signals by surface receptors that receive and bind at particular ligands that can either cause a downstream reaction or, or action, or they can block that intracellular action. And we think of those as agonists that cause that activity and antagonists that block that activity. So those little receptors, if you think about a cell, think about a cell with a bunch of antennas, little antennas sticking up all over the outside of it. Every antenna can only get one radio signal, which means only one particular ligand or agonist can, can bind and cause that. So that's kind of how all the cells and tissues in your body communicate. That's the primary pathway. There's also hormones and there's other, other pathways of communication, but the primary pathway of communication in our bodies come from neurotransmitters binding in these little cell surface receptors that we wanna think of as like antennas setting up there. You've heard of neurotransmitters before. Everybody's heard of, um, everybody's heard of adrenaline, which is epinephrine and neuroepinephrine. Uh, we've all heard of serotonin. We've all heard of dopamine. These are neurotransmitters. There's also glutamate, GABA, and different ones. We make other neurotransmitters, which are endogenous cannabinoids, and that is what we know of as anandamide and 2-AG. These are neurotransmitters just like any other neurotransmitters that we know of. They're just not nearly as well studied. So to have a system, we've got to have these cell surface receptors. We've got the CB1 and CB2 receptors. We have to have some exogenous, which is outside the body, or endogenous, created inside the body, binding ligands or neurotransmitters. We've got to have a mechanism by which to produce these small chemical moieties. And we also have to have a mechanism of degradation. Together, this creates the entire system. And we'll get into that, of course, a little bit deeper. Now, first, we've got the endocannabinoid receptor CB1. This was the first one to be isolated. Uh, it's a presynaptic, or it exists on the presynaptic side of the neuron that I will explain a little bit better, but for intensive, all intensive purposes, you can see the presynaptic neurons are these ones on top, right? And the nerve transmission goes from here down to here, which is the postsynaptic. So when this nerve depolarizes, fires, sends its signal or whatever, it goes from here down to there, from the pre to the post. So these particular receptors or antennas are called G-protein coupled receptors, and they're on the presynaptic side. These are one of the most abundant G-protein coupled receptors in the central nervous system. And the G-protein coupled receptors are one of the most abundant type of receptors on the cell surface. They're 10 times more prevalent than the mu opiate receptor, which is the target of hydrocodone, oxycodone, morphine, heroin, that's the most common, um, one of the most common opiate receptors. They do play a homeostatic or regulatory type role through the modulation of neurotransmission. These CB1 receptors are express, expressed both in glutamate and GABA. These are both neurotransmitters. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. GABA, or gamma amino butyric acid, is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Uh, they're distributed throughout the brain, predominantly in the cerebellum, the cerebral cortex, hippocampus, basal ganglia, brainstem, and spinal cord. Uh, they have a lot to do with how we perceive and relay cell signaling. Also found in some non-neuronal tissue, like adipose, which is fat tissue, liver, pancreas, 
um, in pancreatic beta cells, which are, have, have a role in metabolism and insulin production, and also in some skeletal muscles and definitely predominant in immune system. We also have CB2, which is also a G protein coupled receptor. These are most prevalent in the immune system. Um, B lymphocytes have been shown to express the highest amounts of CB2 followed by natural killer cells, macrophages, and T lymphocytes. These are all part of the immune system that goes out and attacks uh, anything foreign that comes into your body. These are primarily immunomodulatory and anti-inflammatory. So we think of immunomodulatory, generally we're thinking about down-regulating the activity of these cells. This decreases neuroinflammation, which is inflammation of the nerve cells themselves, and displays an immunosuppressive effect. Not immunosuppressive to the degree of like embro or something like that, but uh, and also they inhibit immune cell activation and pro-inflammatory cytokine productions, which are things that are involved in inf inflammatory process. So of the endocannabinoids, so these are basically cannabinoids that our body makes. We know of two of them that we've identified and studied pretty well. And we already talked about them, anandamide and arachidonic, uh, N arachidonoethanolamide, it's one of my favorite words. It's named for anandamide, which is from the Sanskrit word for bliss. Go figure, huh? Uh, it is a fatty acid neurotransmitter. It's synthesized on demand from arachidonic acid um, and inarachidonal phosphatidoethanolamide, which is shortened down to NAEP through multiple pathways. If you read much about marijuana, you're going to see that term NAEP in there, and you're also going to see FAAH, which is the enzyme fatty acid amine hydrolase, uh, which, is, which is what basically breaks it down or builds it up as well. It's a partial agonist at both CB1 and CB2 receptors. Partial, which it means that it doesn't have a very high binding affinity, uh, but it does produce some of the downstream effects that you would expect from, uh, from it. Uh, we also have 2-AG, which is a derivative, again, of arachidonic acid. It's also produced on demand on the post. Now, these are produced on the post-synaptic side. There's no evidence of vesicle storage. It acts in a retrograde fashion, being released from the postsynaptic terminal and traveling across the synaptic cleft to bind at the CB1 and CB2 receptors. It regulates neurotransmitter release from the presynaptic terminal by down-regulating ion channels and increasing refractory period. That is the most important sentence in all of the slides so far to understanding how this works. It down-regulates ion channels and their activity. It's a full agonist of both CB1 and CB2. Now we have phytocannabinoids. These obviously phyto, they're gonna come from the plant, marijuana plant, they're derived from the cannabis plant. They possess activity of both of those two receptors. THC and CBD are the ones we've all heard of. Those are the most well studied. We have some other ones, some CBG, cannabigerol, uh, cannabinol, cannabichrome, along with significant other alkaloids and terpenes are found in this plant, um, which definitely produces some issues with the FDA because the FDA is used to approving one molecule at a time that has specific activity at a particular and specific receptor type. So many patients and clinicians report a better response produced by what is known as the full spectrum or full profile preparations, as opposed to isolated agents containing only THC or CBD. We talk, we talk about this as the entourage effect. So THC is delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. It's a weak agonist, or it causes the action downstream rather than blocking it. It's a weak agonist at both receptors, CB1 and CB2. It has a very low binding affinity, uh, so it's not real strong. It's similar to anandamide in that it's a partial agonist. It's very rapidly absorbed by inhalation, although it's got a very low bioavailability of only 25%. Reason being, it's very highly, highly lipophilic. It's it very high, it distributes very highly. It has a very high volume of distribution. Um, it pushes into adipose tissue, again, fat tissue, liver, lung, and spleen, where it slow releases over time. The lipophilic nature of this molecule and the fact that it distributes very well into adipose or fat tissue is one of the reasons why we can detect it in your blood up to 30 days after uh, someone has stopped using it because it slow releases out of those tissues over time. Uh, it's metabolized through cytochrome P450, which is a little more than we need for this discussion. It can be detected 
for up to 30 days after use. Uh, cannabidiol also, you know, we've all heard of CBD, right? Not a direct agonist at either one of these receptors, but actually acts in a different way. It's very unique in that it's really an allosteric modulator. So it kind of binds at a secondary pocket and it affects the binding pocket conformation of the original ligand to either increase or decrease that binding affinity. So it regulates the binding of both the endogenous that we produce on our own and exogenous that we bring in from outside, cannabinoids. And it's known to demonstrate both anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective effects. Now the FDA, it's also available um, on the standard drug market. The FDA approved in 2018, the anti-seizure drug Epidiolex, which is 100 milligrams CBD per ml solution for the treatment of Lennox, Lennox Galt and Dravot syndrome. Now these are very severe seizure disorders uh, suffered generally by children. Uh, and they are not only life-threatening, they shorten, shorten the life very, very much. Uh, very interesting study if you ever want to look that one up. Great, great information in that. All right, so now we're kind of getting the meat of it. Let's put it all together. So we talked about uh, ligand binding and infinity and all this kind of thing. So if we look at, and can you guys, uh, hopefully everybody can see my, um, my, my mouse, but you can see the presynaptic side of the neuron. And then you can see the postsynaptic. And what's happening with all of these little purple circles in the middle is the presynaptic neuron is relaying a message to the postsynaptic neuron. Now this happens, I don't know, about a billion times a day in our bodies. And it happens at a rate that's mind boggling. So the best way for me to explain it is, let's say I'm down at Drexel and we're talking to some important people and Jim Sebring's standing there and I start to say something wrong and he reaches over and he, he Steve reaches over and he steps on my foot. Now, if he just steps on my foot on accident, I'm going to feel it on my toe because there'll be a noxious stimuli from my big toe that will depolarize that nerve. Now, that nerve goes from my big toe all the way up into my spinal cord. Think of that long thread we talked about. When it goes into my spinal cord, the first place it's going to do what's depicted here, which is called a synapse, is in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. So basically this action potential, okay, or electric signal comes all the way up the pre-synapse and then it synapses and goes to the post-synaptic side to go up my spinal cord into my brain stem to synapse again. Now, if we just think about that first spot, those little purple neurotransmitters coming across that gap are what take that signal over there. Now, if Jim steps on my foot lightly, I'm going to feel it. And that thing is going to synapse again and again. It's not that it's a one and done. It, it hits and hits and hits and hits and hits. Now, if he raises up with his work boots on and stomps on my toe and breaks it, how does my body differentiate the degree of pain that I'm feeling? it differentiates by the rate of frequency, the frequency of that activity. So the frequency of firing from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic, how many times per second does that happen? It can happen, and, and, it's, and it's, you know, it's, it, it's hard to get your mind around just how fast these things go. So if he stomps on my toe, it's firing so fast that very high frequency of firing, that pain signal is what tells my brain, I have a real problem and this is severe pain, my toe is broke. Um, so let's say he breaks my toe and this thing is just firing off at a super high frequency and I'm on the ground, I'm like, oh, Jim, you broke my toe, you broke my toe. And I go to the doctor and the doctor gives me a hydrocodone. All right. Well, what's going to happen is when I take the hydrocodone, it will bind at a receptor on that presynaptic side, and it will actually slow down the rate at which that presynaptic pain signal can fire to the next one. It slows down that nerve's ability to send that signal at such a high frequency. That's why we always say an opiate will decrease your sensation of the pain that you're in, but it does nothing to actually help your pain. 
Now, what you see on the right side is what we call an action potential. So there really is, on the left side, you can see the volts up and down, all right? And, and these are regulated by ions, right? The sodium and potassium, you know how they have the little sodium's got a couple little plus signs by it. Chlorine has a negative sign by it. So these particular elements we know as ions. That's what's involved in creating an actual ability for an electrical impulse to travel up that nerve. It takes a bit of time, tiny bit of time, but it does take a bit of time for that presynaptic nerve to get ready to fire the next pain signal. That time in blue on the action potential curve is called the refractory period. Now it's broken down in this to an absolute and a relative refractory period. <clears throat> but altogether, let's just think of that as a refractory period. So it fires a pain signal. It has to repolarize and get ready to fire another one. Now remember, frequency is everything. If we slow down the frequency, we slow down the rate at which it can fire, thereby decreasing my sensation of overall pain. So what does marijuana do? We can see step one, we have an action potential. Step two, we have calcium channels that open up, which causes that depolarization, which is that spike up in the action potential curve. Step three, these little neurotransmitters, and this could be epinephrine, it could be glutamate, it could be aspartate, you know, there's, there's any number of neurotransmitters gonna come across that cleft. So those neurotransmitters travel across the synaptic cleft. Step five, we have an upgraded, upregulated neurotransmitters, which open, open a particular calcium channel. This calcium influx on the postsynaptic side is gonna stimulate the synthesis of AEA and 2AG. These are our endocannabinoids, which retrograde, which travel basically backwards, right? That's what retrograde means, go backwards across that cleft. Now they're gonna bind up here, step seven, at the cannabinoid receptor activates. Number eight, that regulates neuronal release. And number nine, CV degradation by FAH and MAGL, which are just enzymes that break it down. So that's kind of the, the whole thing put together. This is a little bit better schematic. So if we look over on the left side, we can see that the presynaptic neurons, which are coming down from the top, are releasing all of these little neurotransmitters, glutamate, GABA, you know, whatever. Now that glutamate receptor on the, and you can see at the bottom of the page, postsynaptic neuron, right? Now, as that's firing, the more frequently that nerve fires, the more the postsynaptic neuron creates anandamide and 2-AG from arachidonic acid and ethanolamide. So if we have a very high frequency of firing, i.e. Jim just broke my toe, then we are going to have a large amount of our endogenous cannabinoids, anandamide and 2-AG, going backwards across that cleft. Now, this is something that's really neat. In pharmacy school, I learned about this and all of these neurotransmitters, and every single time, those neurotransmitters went one direction. They went from the presynaptic side to the postsynaptic side. It was not until I got into marijuana and I really studied this and, and, and got up with the, uh, with the research, this endocannabinoid system is the only neuronal signaling system that we know of that travels backwards. It comes from the postsynaptic side to the presynaptic side. And that is why we say it is a neuromodulator. So you can see in the upper right-hand corner, of this particular schematic, that the anandamide and the 2-AG are binding to what's called a G-protein complex, right? That's that G-protein coupled receptor right there, labeled CB1. Now, when that happens, there is a downstream effect that involves adenocyclase and cyclic AMP. The final result is, you can see the red line going over, and it's got the little minus right beside the calcium channel. So the final result is, when that G protein coupled receptor is bound by 2-AG or anandamide or exogenous cannabinoids like THC or CBD, it will downregulate the rate at which that ion channel can function. So it decreases the frequency 
at which that nerve can fire. Or you could also say it increases the refractory period. Basically the same thing that an opiate does. An opiate has a different G protein coupled receptor than the CB1 or CB2. But the final effect of an opiate binding its G protein coupled receptor is exactly the same. It downregulates the activity of those receptors and it decreases the, ability, the, the nerve's ability to fire at such a high frequency. That's where we get the clinical effects. So this is really the takeaway. Number one, you've got to have the whole system put together, right? We've got to be able to, we got to have all of these components in place. And then once we have all of these components in place and we have an action potential firing from the pre to post synaptic side, this is how our body downregulates overactive neurons. Now, medical application of pain, right? We know marijuana is definitely inferior to opiates for acute pain control, definitely is. Um, in chronic pain though, medical marijuana certainly carries fewer long-term risks. In actuality, the combination of medical marijuana and opiates for chronic pain can produce greater analgesia or pain control than with either agent alone. The total daily dose of each agent can be lowered. In fact, this is exactly what happens to opiate use in states where marijuana is legal. We see opiate use decrease just when marijuana is allowed to be used by patients who need it. Um, let me just bump one slide forward. So when we look at marijuana versus opiates, if, if you look down, you know, binds to G protein coupled cell surface receptor, decreases cyclic AMP, inhibits calcium influx into the cell, the neuronal cell is hyperpolarized. It decreases the cell firing and nerve signal transduction and results in a decreased sensation of pain. Different G protein coupled receptors. So what do we say about two drugs that do the same thing? So they have the same final effect, but they come about it in two different ways or through two different pathways. That's synergy. That is the very definition of drug synergy. And we use synergy of different drugs in many, many ways in pharmacy and in standard medicine. Um, the best um, example I have of this, let me check my time here, 32, all right, we're moving. This is, the, this is the meat of it. This is what I want everybody to see because this is really what hung me up when I got into it. I always read about, you know, and, and I started researching marijuana and it's a homeostatic modulator. It's a regulator and all this stuff. That didn't mean anything to me. I needed to know exactly what it does. So that's what I'm trying to give up over to you guys. So many times the pharmacist people said, oh, I've got my you know, six-year-old granddaughter with me and she's got a fever. Should I give her Tylenol or should I give her Advil? Actually, you give them both. You give them Tylenol, four hours later, you give them Advil. Four hours later, you give them Tylenol. Four hours later, you give them Advil. Well, why do we do that? Well, because those drugs together produce a better effect than either agent alone. That's one side. The other side is if you give a child only Tylenol all day to control a fever, you're pushing the max daily dose of that drug by the end of the day. If you're only, if you're dispersing it and giving Tylenol and then Advil and then Tylenol and then Advil, you're not pushing the total daily dose of either of those drugs. You're only giving half as much as you would if you used either one of those agents alone. And we see the same thing with people who are on chronic opiate treatment when we introduce marijuana they begin immediately to decrease the amount of opiates that they take because they don't need as much. They only need half as much or even 25% as much because the marijuana is on board working synergistically to produce better analgesia. So cannabinoid opiate interaction in chronic pain. Human studies shows inhaled cannabis potentiates the analgesia of opiates. There is no known documented negative drug interaction between opiates and marijuana. The drug interactions we look for with opiates are respiratory in nature. When you OD from taking too much opiates, you quit breathing because it decreases your respiratory, your, your, your ability or your normal uh, body's um, process to, to breathe. Marijuana does not decrease respiration. <clears throat> so in the down regulation of pain, you can really kind of see it here. So on the left, we have a peripheral nerve. That's on the, the upper left of this peripheral nerve. Let's say that's my big toe. And that's the one Jim just stepped on. It goes all the way up my uh, femur and all the way up my leg to the dorsal horn of the spine where it releases these. And then this 
postsynaptic neuron will bring over here. This is a MOR, which is a mu opiate receptor, uh, which down regulates, you can see the two minuses, this particular calcium influx channel. Same thing over here. Uh, we've got a G protein coupled receptor and really what's happening is we're regulating this ion channel and this nerve's ability to repolarize and fire another signal. Um, also, as, you know, as far as the medical applications, as a lot of medical, uh, it, everybody looks at marijuana a lot for cancer. So uh, medical marijuana is not gonna soon replace any current cancer treatments, uh, but it is a viable option, certainly for the management of symptoms secondary to disease and the treatment of cancer. Uh, like dronabinol, marinol is an FDA approved drug. It's THC isolate um, in pill form, and it's uh, indicated for chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. It's very effective at that. But it's not well tolerated by people. Again, we kind of need to go back to that entourage effect. It seems that full profile marijuana uh, formulations are more effective than isolates like marinol, which is an isolated THC. So presently, there's insufficient evidence to support or refute the conclusion that cannabinoids are that have been effective treatment for cancers, including glioma. If you look at the literature, you'll find a lot of positive about it, and you also find a lot of negative about it. But mostly what you find if you really read the studies is inconclusive. There is conclusive evidence that oral cannabinoids are effective antiemetics, as in treating nausea vomiting, and the treatment of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. There is substantial evidence that cannabis is an effective treatment for chronic pain in adults. So our routes of administration in Pennsylvania, we have the oral route, um, tablets, capsules, oils, tinctures, sauces, all stuff like that. We have the, obviously, the inhalation route. In Pennsylvania, you're still not allowed to smoke it. You've got to inhale or uh, you've got to vaporize the dried flour or the oil. Uh, we have a topical route. We have creams, oils, even transdermal patches. Um, Solutions for nebulization are approved in Pennsylvania, but I've never actually seen this come out. And again, rectal suppositories. So some dosing considerations, the most important thing is that we look at is someone's experience with the drug. Um, the last thing we want to do is get grandma snowed out on the couch saying I can't move my arms. And that happens more than you might think. So that's one of the reasons why medical professionals are important in the program. Some patients may be reluctant to be forthcoming with the true amount of their experience or for a variety of reasons. Second biggest thing, most important thing we look at is cardiovascular risk. Uh, we look at the condition we're treating, concomitant conditions that they may have, asthma, COPD, congestive heart failure. We look at their current prescription meds to check for interactions and assess life, lifestyle to determine the level of adversity to the psychoactive component. Uh, we do have some interactions. I'll kind of breeze through these as quick as I can. I know these are, uh, you know, kind of at a high level, but THC and CBD are metabolized by these two particular cytochrome, um, 3A4 and 2C9. Uh, there are plenty of drugs that will inhibit the degradation of marijuana by inhibiting cytochrome 3A4. That will increase levels of THC. And you can see some similarities here. We've got ketoconazole, itraconazole, Voriconazole, those are all antifungals. Uh, we've got erythromycin, cyclosporin, which are antibiotics, and verapamil, which is um, for blood pressure, basically. Um, and we also have drugs that will induce or uh, that, that particular metabolic pathway, and that will decrease your THC, THC levels. An example of that is rifampin that we use for tuberculosis or TB exposure. Now, CBD is a potent inhibitor of a couple of these pathways, it can increase concentration of other drugs, which is something we look at very close. Macrolides, which are antibiotics, calcium channel blockers that we use for um, high blood pressure. Benzodiazepines like Xanax or Valium that we you know, use for mood stabilization and, and certain things like that and sleep. Um, cyclosporin, some PDE5 inhibitors like Viagra and, and Cialis. Uh, some antihistamines and, and more. So now the biggest interaction that I know of is warfarin. Warfarin is an anticoagulant. Um, it is for somebody who has had a cardiovascular event and we're worried about clot formation. Um, the INR, which is basically what we use to measure how much they are anticoagulated, will very likely increase. 
Um, so we do have recommendations on how we want to initiate marijuana therapy um, in people like that. Depakote is used for bipolar and seizures. There's a very real interaction with Depakote and CBD that affects the liver where the AST and ALT levels, which are a couple of things that we measure for liver function. So we do wanna monitor liver function tests upon initiation of marijuana therapy in patients that are currently uh, normalized on Depakote. Um, Clobazam, Onfi, which is a seizure medicine used primarily in kids, sorry about that. And there are other interactions that should be expected between marijuana and drugs, primarily with sympathomimetic activity like tachycardia and hypertension, uh, central nervous system depressants like drowsiness and ataxia, and drugs with anticholinergic effects. So probably a little over the audience head right now. Sorry about that. Side effects, um, dry mouth obviously is the most prevalent. Some dizziness, some drowsiness, increased appetite, which actually is a therapeutic target sometimes, uh, short-term memory impairment, decreased motivation, depression, anxiety, and addiction. The addiction potential CDC reports addiction rate of about one in 10, uh, drops to one in six when we start using before the age of 18. The addiction is seen as psychological rather than physical. Uh, so there's very little physical withdrawal with this, uh, possible headache, maybe some chills and sweating, but most people that withdraw from marijuana is you're just kind of in a bad mood for two or three days. Some of the signs that someone might be addicted, um, what you standardly would look for, they have unsuccessful attempts to quit, giving up important activities with friends or family and using marijuana, even when they know it's causing them problems. One thing we know is when states legalize, um, good things happen. So there's definitely association between U.S. state medical cannabis laws and opiate prescribing in the population. Uh, the study found that from 2010 to 2015, average prescriptions filled for all opiates um, to 23.08 million daily doses per year. This number fell by 2.11 million daily doses per year when states enacted any type of marijuana legalization law, including grow only. Also found that the same number decreased by 3.7 million daily doses per year when the states opened up dispensaries. So that's up to a 14% decrease in opiate daily doses per year. We have some similar studies and there's a, a lot we can talk about, but I'm running out of time. So let me see if I can wrap this up. So this basically suggests that marijuana is filling a legitimate medical purpose, uh, which as a medical professional and a pharmacist for many years, I can attest to that personally. It definitely fills a legitimate medical purpose. Uh, we do have some contraindications and precautions. If we have any known allergy, if someone is in acute psychosis or some other unstable psychiatric condition like schizophrenia, we definitely do not want to get them high. It's not what we're trying to do. And it makes things worse. Uh, precautions, cardiovascular disease, uh, arrhythmias of the heart. Um, immunological disease, impaired hepatic or renal function, hepatic is liver, renal is kidney, uh, or a history of addiction. The addiction potential, I think, I think I put that in there twice. Sorry about that. All right. Um, last thing I want to wrap up with, cardiovascular disease. So there's one last thing that I, I want to get across to you guys, and let me stop sharing my screen right now, and I'll just talk straight on this. The reason we look at cardiovascular issues is because this, the first thing I want you to take home from this is how the endocannabinoid system works literally backwards. So rather than causing a signal to go from the periphery to the central nervous system, it goes backwards to control the rate at which that signal can be transmitted. That is how we know marijuana as regulatory. Sorry about that, guys. I'm not quite sure what happened there. All right, so the last thing I wanna leave you with is you need to understand, marijuana is a vasodilator. So it causes blood vessels to get bigger. In doing so, when blood vessels get bigger, the same amount of blood is going through the tube, but all of a sudden the tube's much bigger, which means that Bernoulli's principle 
if you have less fluid in a larger volume of area, the pressure that that fluid is exerting on the outside of the blood vessel is going to decrease. Now, so we take some marijuana, we get some vasodilation, the blood pressure drops. The brain immediately knows that this happens. The brain tells the heart, okay, let's get the blood pressure going. It tells the heart to do two things, increase the rate of contraction or how fast it's beating, and also increase the force of contraction or how hard the left ventricle squeezes to get that blood out. Both of these are in effect to increase the volume of blood that's leaving the heart to fill that space and bring the blood pressure back up. The brain tells the heart to do this by the release of epinephrine and neuroepinephrine. So we have some marijuana, we have some vasodilation, we have a, a drop in blood pressure. There's a release of adrenaline, which is epinephrine and neuroepinephrine, which causes the heart to increase in rate and increase in contractility. You can feel your heart beating faster and you can feel your heart beating harder in your chest. Now, let's say you're someone with anxiety. If you are a kid and, you know, we're in, in school and this happens and all of a sudden I feel like, well, hey, my heart's beating faster, it's beating stronger, I've got some energy, come on, let's go out and do something. I feel invigorated, I feel ready to go. I feel like I wanna go do something. But you fast forward that 15 years, I have a home, I have a car with a car payment, I have a home with a mortgage, I have kids, I have a, a, a career. All of a sudden you feel your heart beating out of your chest and it's pounding, pounding, that's an anxiety attack. So we wanna be very careful with, again, people with cardiovascular issues that have a lot of cardiovascular risk. We want to come very, very slowly and we wanna be real clear about that effect because that's not good for old people with cardiovascular issues. And also it leads us to know that marijuana is just as likely to cause or potentiate an anxiety attack as it is to help it. And that's kind of how I'm gonna wrap up. I hope everybody kind of picked up a couple things, just base, kind of base understanding of what's going on with this drop. And I think now it's Q&A time. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, so definitely wanted a um, question for me at least, and definitely wanted to let everyone know, if you do have questions, please drop them in the chat. I'll read them off to Mike um, as okay. I come in. Um, but one of the questions that I have, um, kind of going back to um, the pre and post uh, um, synaptic neurons, um, thinking about when we do use cannabis in those um, moments, um, so we, we produce those two um, cannabinoids naturally within our body. How right, do right. we, um, how does cannabis either increase or decrease that or kind of regulate it through that? Right. So your body has a down regulating mechanism in place, and those are your endo, our endocannabinoids. So again, you just broke my tongue, all right? I've got this firing away and I've got a high intensity of pain. Well, 20 minutes after you broke my toe, it doesn't feel the same. It's not as bad as it was, right? I mean, the worst pain is the first couple of minutes after the, the, the initial insult happens. That is your body, the endocannabinoids down-regulating. Our bodies also produce uh, endorphins, which are which mimic, you know, or which opiates mimic our own endorphins. So our body has its own down-regulating mechanism. When we bring in opiates or exogenous cannabinoids, we're simply supplementing that and we're down-regulating it at a higher rate than our bodies would do it on their own with our own internal um, neurotransmitters. Perfect. So I do have another question here from um, someone else on our team, um, kind of in terms of more on the... Um, dealing with kind of prescribing doctors and, and people who um, may not always have a, a good background in it. Um, how confident are you in terms of kind of when a, a patient comes into a dispensary, their level of knowledge that their primary care provider, whoever pr prescribed them is kind of giving them good quality information and kind of how do you deal with that and kind of what recommendations um, might you provide with that patient? Well, we're generally not um, not really confident with the kind of information that most patients come in with. Um, that's one thing that Pennsylvania really did right for sure in their program is they mandated medical professionals um, in the in, in the dispensaries. Um, some of the dispensaries did a little better than others by putting these putting by hiring pharmacists and getting this out there and getting us a lot of patient contact. 
Um, but every dispensary you go in should have the option for you to consult with a medical professional. Um, we actually mandated it in ours, so we, we talked to a lot of people. Um, but we like to um, educate both our staff and our patients with what we know, uh, which, you know, we always kind of feel like that's a little bit more. You, you never know when somebody comes in what doctor, um, you know, what, what doctor certified them. Their doctor may have given them excellent information or their doctor may have given them almost no information. So that's why the number one thing that we assess with a new patient is what is their history, right? So say I've got somebody that's on Depakote. I wanna know that. We ask what drugs they're on. And if I see they're taking Depakote, or if I see they're taking Warfarin, my next question is, are you using marijuana already? Because if you are, then you're already kind of regulated and I'm not gonna be so concerned. If you're not a marijuana user, then I'm definitely going to, you know, consult with a cardiologist or, or something like that before, before we start. Right. So we, we, it's so varied. I, I don't want to say that we have a little confidence because, you know, there's no practitioners out there that know there's plenty of practitioners out there that know just as much and even more than what we've just gone over, but not all of them. So really in practice, we can't assume anything when a patient comes in, we have to start from scratch every time. Great. So we have a question here from Larissa um, talking about the anxiety attacks and, and kind of how they're caused. Um, is there kind of a difference between um, dosage in terms of ratio, THC to CBD, um, and kind of yes. how that interacts? Absolutely. Um, for anxiety, um, we, always, we always recommend a THC CBD combination. Um, generally, I really like a 50 50 combo or a one to one product. Uh, they're real popular on the market and they're great for anxiety um, because it doesn't really, the CBD kind of takes the edge off of that a little bit. There's very little psychoactive effect. Um, and also with people uh, for anxiety, we always start with indica because it seems that the indicas have a little less, um, they, a little less potentiation of that vasodilatory effect. And anytime we see anxiety as a reason for certification for marijuana, we always want to bring those people in and we want to talk to them and say, look, you have to understand, depending on what product you use, one product here could, could make your, could really relieve your anxiety and you're just chill and calm and it's a great day. Another one could throw you right into a panic attack. And we explain the physiological process behind that with the vasodilation and the adrenaline release, uh, and, and it really helps. So for anxiety, to answer that question, we always, we always want to recommend a one-to-one, -one, one part THC, one part CBD. And if she hasn't tried that, she definitely should. Great. So we have another question here from Aaron. Um, what inspired you to get into the cannabis industry, and how did you be, uh, become involved uh, with and begin researching? Um, well, I was, um, I was a, a pharmacy manager for Rite Aid in Clarksburg, West Virginia for a number of years, uh, right in the middle of the opiate epidemic. And every night I would go home and literally sometimes in tears to my wife, wondering if I'm part of the problem or if I'm part of the solution. And I've always been a fan of natural medicine and holistic medicine, Eastern medicine. And I just don't think that you can discount in full, any of those things. Um, so I saw an opportunity in, in 2017 and I went for it. And so I, once, once I, I got the job, um, I switched over and now I absolutely am part of the solution. I have, I no longer have a, a moral dilemma uh, over what I'm dispensing. Great. It's been a great ride. Next um, question here is from Kyle Ball. Um, have there been any studies to your knowledge on the uh, effects of uh, cannabinoids on PrEP um, and kind of HIV treatments, um, anything related to HIV? Yeah, really what it, the bulk of the research related to HIV uh, has to do with the taxia um, or you know, the chronic wasting that, that kind of comes in and, and the inability to, to keep food down and you continue to drop weight, drop weight. Cannabis can be very, very effective as an appetite stimulant in that scenario. Um, as far as uh, the other hand is that it kind of down regulates the immune system. Uh, but in HIV, you've got such, that's such an issue anyway, 
um, that it, it's, it's really kind of, um, you know, just one ant on the anthill. Uh, it is, does seem to be real promising for the ataxia, uh, but I, I really haven't seen any studies that lend me to believe that, that marijuana is any kind of a, a benefit in any other way to uh, that, that devastating progression of disease. I'm sorry. I think I miscommunicated. I was specifically talking about, um, cause you had mentioned it affects antiretrovirals and I know recreational marijuana use is growing within a lot of communities that are affected by it. Is there have been any studies on like the effect of cannabinoids on the effect, the efficacy of prep? I have not seen any studies like that though. I'm, I'm not come across a, a single and, and, you know, PrEP medications are very new. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't really expect to see a whole lot there uh, just because they've, those have come out and, and just begun to be widely distributed over the last few years. Um, but no, I have seen no studies that deal with the association of medical marijuana and PrEP drugs. Another question here uh, from Joe. Um, have you seen any differences in uh, like the mode of consumption, edibles, tinctures, uh, smoking, vaping, uh, drinkable in terms of their efficacy? Um, really not necessarily with the efficacy because what we're looking at is in, with a different um, route of administration, um, what we're really looking at is a, is a different um, time of onset and duration of action. So it's not actually the end phase activity that's affected as much as how long does it take to get to an efficacious concentration of drug in the blood and how long will that concentration last in the blood? So it, it's more of a pharmacodynamic issue as opposed to end, uh, end stage efficacy. So the efficacy of the drug is really uh, going to be there. It's a concentration dependent thing. It just depends on how long. So, you know, obviously if you're smoking marijuana, it's a very, very rapid onset, as opposed to if you eat marijuana, it could take up to an hour or an hour and a half to actually, you know, feel any effect from that. Smoking lasts, doesn't last more than a few hours, whereas an, an edible can last many hours. Um, alternatively, not, and surprisingly, the, the rectal route is a very effective route to get this drug into the system. Uh, that area is, is, is very highly vascular. So we get a real rapid and very complete absorption. There's a high bioavailability that comes from that. Uh, so there are situations where that's good medicine. One more question here um, in terms of um, your recommendation for patients looking more about like terpene profile on cannabis. And I kind of wanted to add to this. Um, I was on a call um, two, three weeks ago um, talking with people about the entourage effects, kind of the idea right. that THC, CBD, all of the different cannabinoids combined with the terpene profiles, commonly known linalol, commonly found in lavender, caryophylline, and commonly found in pepper, very anti-inflammatory. Um, it's very disputed right now within the med medical community whether that's truly evidence-based. Um, based on what you've seen um, in research as well as kind of um, anecdotally through working in the dispensary, um, what are your thoughts on kind of um, that the entourage effect and, and terpenes effect with patients? The terpenes and the entourage effect is everything. Um, that's why there were, you know, times in our dispensary, we had over 600 different products uh, because, and they were all unique in their own right with the different cannabinoid and terpene profiles. Um, so my advice is to research the terpenes, find the terpene profile that works best for you. Um, and, and it's out there. Um, my personal experience, terpenoline is my favorite terpene. It just, it's happy, happy, happy for me. Um, there are other like uh, terpenes like um, limoline that have a tendency to give me a little anxiety. Um, so I have personally felt different effects from different per terpene profiles. And really that's where it's at. And therein lies the rub. Because if we're going to ever get this drug into standard medicine, that's the hang up. The FDA will, you know, receive a request from a drug company to approve a molecule. It is one chemical moiety that we know has activity at a particular receptor type on a particular cell type that's displayed in a particular tissue type. 
And we're looking for this downstream agonistic or antagonistic effect. The FDA and standard medicine really has no way to do what we consider evidence-based medicine, which is of course the gold standard trial, with something that has hundreds of different compounds. Uh, and, and that's really, you know, that's, that's where that big leap happens. I'm in, involved in some, some things on some other levels about trying to bring this medicine into this drug into standard medicine. And that's one of the real hangups because how can you, you can't just put it behind a pharmacy counter. You know, we're going to, we're talking about five or 600 products or more that you that we have in a dispensary. So yeah, the entourage effect, it, it's everything. So it, it's really the crux of, crux of the argument. So if you're a user, if you're medicating uh, with medical marijuana, absolutely pay attention, log, keep, a, keep a, a diary or a log of the products you use and not only the cannabinoid, but also the terpene profiles. And those are printed on the label. They're small, but they're on there. Definitely. And in terms of um, kind of more on the retail side question, um, something that I've had in terms of um, product availability, it seems like a lot within Pennsylvania, a lot of the grower processors tend to um, cater to the market. And I, I would love to get your perspective in terms of on the pharmacist side, um, finding it difficult to find one-to-one -one strain flour, um, yeah. finding it difficult to find certain um, terpene profiles, um, is there any kind of progress on that end in your opinion or um, to, to be able to find those replacements or what are the best ways to go about finding those strains that, that work for people? Your best opportunity for that, if you find something that works well for you, is to frequent a dispensary that has informed bud tenders and informed staff um, because, you know, obviously the market follows buying trends. And you're right, it's almost impossible to find one-to-one -one flour. And I can tell you as someone who runs dispensaries, it's difficult to sell one-to-one -one flour. There's really not much of a market, which is why grow processors don't make it. Um, I think there, I would like for there to be at least um, a list of capsules, pills that are available to people um, all the time that would be consistent. Uh, because we had this issue very bad. You know, you come into my pharmacy and you need hydrochlorothiazide. I'm going to have hydrochlorothiazide 25 milligrams to control your blood pressure for you. And it doesn't matter if it's made by Sandoz or Teva or, or Myelin. It's going to be 25 milligrams of hydrochlorothiazide in every pill. And I'm going to have it. Unfortunately, when we have people come in and say they, they get onto the Cresco Relax capsules, which are huge sellers very highly sought after, very effective. I, I can't count on my hands and toes how many people take one or two of those every night. That's what they take and that's how they medicate. And they have dropped off, you know, prescription after prescription after prescription by replacing it. I, I'd like to see a handful of, of products that would be mandated to be available at all times. And I think that would lend a lot of legitimacy to the medical side of the program. Uh, but unfortunately, that does not exist, and uh, we, we find patients really working hard so to, to try to find the same thing. So your best option is to be informed about what works well for you, take that back to the dispensary, and someone at the dispensary should be able to tell you, okay, you had that last time. I know what we have now that's very, very similar to that. And you're really going to rely on the people at the dispensary to help you make those adjustments. Now, in terms of kind of those reg those regulations, do you think that type of mandate is that kind of standard practice throughout um, pharmacies? Um, well, in pharmacy, yeah, in, in standard pharmacy, yeah, you're going to have those meds, and they're going to be the same every time, and, and it's massively regulated. Um, but in, in marijuana, no, it, it, it is not. It, it, you would literally, the state would have to mandate a list of products that would have to be, would have to be made. And, and, and I, just, I just don't know how you would roll that kind of regulation out. Um, you know, you, you'd find yourself in court really fast from industry. Um, so that's just kind of the progression of medical marijuana as we know. It's one of the growing pains that we have. 
one of the many. <laughs> Sounds like consumer education might be needed on that end as well, too, to kind of adjust the market. <laughs> yeah, one of the things I, I, I really like the best about mer medical marijuana and since I've been in it is that in standard medicine, the longer I would know someone, generally the more prescriptions they were on. The medication burden only increased over time with no real pathway to come back down. Since I've been in medical marijuana, the majority of our patients that are on standard medicines over time, their medication burden decreases. And the primary reason for that is personal education. Um, the days of going to the doctor, I don't know anything about my medicine or about you know what you're saying, all this stuff's over my head. Hey doc, I rely on you, you make the decisions, you tell me what to do, I'll do it. Those days are over. Um, patients need to be self-educated and especially in the field of medical marijuana, if you are a, a, a certified user of medical marijuana, education is your greatest friend. It's, it's your best ally. You really need to know your products and, and document what you're taking and self-educate and, and work with the medical professionals at your dispensary because they know, they really, really know a lot. Great. Thanks, Mike, for your time. Um, this has been great. Thank you everyone for your questions. Um, this recording will be uploaded and posted hopefully by the end of the week, um, if not soon thereafter. Um, thanks again, Mike, and thank you everyone else for your time. I hope everybody's leaving with a little more than they came in with. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Excellent presentation. Learned a ton. Thanks, Thank Steve. you so much. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure. Do you have a contact 